Hey, what's up, guys? It's Fiasco, and we're playing Ultimate General Civil War with the Confederacy on normal difficulty. And this is our Let's Play through that campaign. Hey, we're finally here. This is the camp before Gaines Mill, and we're jumping into it. So in Gaines Mill, we need to have two different corps on the field, uh, in the front and on the far right. And they're going to come in in phases, and we need to dislodge an entrenched federal position, Union position. So Union forces made up... Uh, McClellan's flank are, are dug in behind uh, entrenchments there. Now, from the perspective of the Union player, this is actually a pretty uh, frustrating battle because it's my general belief that uh, entrenchments are a good way to get your men killed. Uh, and I do make use of some of that here in my playthrough of the battle. So it was just telling us that our main corps is going to enter on the left there, and then portions of our reinforcements are going to come in piecemeal on the far uh, upper right, which uh, makes it hard for them to get kind of into a useful position in the battle uh, quickly. Now, they're going to get reinforcements of their own, and they're going to come from the south there. So we're going to move into attack position with our S-foils um, with um, the initial forces that we're given. And the game advises us, and I think this is probably a good course of action, is to pick up a defensive position, knock out their skirmishers, uh, and determine a good angle of attack. Um, so as per something Compass's advice, I, I pull off everything here and decide, what do I want to open this battle with? Um, and ultimately, I decide that my Vanguard troops is probably going to be some of my newer guys because they're going to be the ones that are going to be doing um, a, a healthy amount of the fighting. So they're going to be the ones getting kind of beat up, right? So uh, my thought process is, let's have the Vanguard be our newest troops who theoretically speaking i can afford to lose more will support them with uh the um first and second howitzers uh, our sharpshooters and a melee cav unit um the uh, 24 pound howitzers i think are going to be kind of the real weight of the attack force and then of course there's just the physical bodies that were we're going to uh, be able to throw out there. Now, there's a solid mix here of rifled and smoothbore troops, um, but it's all mostly one-star um, one star rookies or one-star. One um, oh, what's the word? Seasoned, but not veteran troops, right? Like So these guys all kind of can handle themselves in the course of a fight. So uh, the Vettels are going to be here to the south, and I'm going to just kind of draw my line over there in that open field where I was just moving the mouse back and forth. Uh, but the first thing we're going to do is we're going to uh, pause and issue our orders. I'm going to go ahead and detach skirmishers and create that first wall or wave uh, and throw them out as a screen and begin advancing my troops uh, or my line infantry, sorry. And then uh, actually I'll end up wanting to throw a screen to my south as well, sort of covering my flank and trusting that my rear and the river uh, are secured because the game tells me they are, basically. <laughs> and w within the purview of this game, no one could attack me over that river uh, anyway. So obviously because the Union starts in some of these positions, they're going to have secured them basically right off the bat. And that's fine. You know, that's um, kicking them out. And this is a defensive battle. The first half of this from the Union perspective is um, it can be just sitting there and waiting in those trenches. Now I tend to play a little more aggressively as the Union on this battle. And I meet the Confederacy at a place where they won't where basically I'll be able to do my strategy here is, is treat the offensive battle defensively and treat it like the First World War. So yeah, I'm throwing out a, a second screen of skirmishers to the south to join uh, the first grouping, as well as moving the sharpshooters and the melee cab up as well. And then I am trying to get uh, the line infantry over the river as quick as possible. I don't like the approach vector um, where if you were to go straight. There's just a lot of marshy, wooded terrain, and then you're crossing a river. and It's like all these things that are just designed to suck up a lot of your, uh, your endurance. Oh, and we do have contact. 
some skirmishers on the water, uh, great target, and then also some skirmishers trying to flank us. So, um, <clears throat> you know, we, we're in we're in woods and they're in the open and they're ready to be shot at. It's a it's a good position for the Confederate skirmishers to be in, and I'm going to go ahead and also redeploy. Um, the melee cav and the sharpshooters here pretty soon. So this is actually a really fun battle uh, for the Confederacy. So Sh Shiloh is kind of your first big one. Oh, and there's also a unit of Union sharpshooters um, who I kind of get tunnel vision on. Like, I really, really, really want to get them because maybe I can get their sharps. Um, their sharps rifles, which are excellent, excellent skirmish, skirmish infantry um, scoped rifles. Or, or even the non-scoped variant. I mean, really, frankly, both are, are great rifles. It's the same thing as a Whitworth and the scope Whitworth, basically. Um, so I remember when I was playing this, uh, my, in <laughs> my intention with a uh, second cav here was to dismount them uh, and use their, their carbines. And then I was, you know, playing, and I realized, uh, oh, 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 they're saber cav, um, which is okay. So skirmishers out in the open, like saber cav, are super happy about that. Yep. All right. So we're trading very, very, very efficiently with that skirmish cav. Uh, so far, no casualties in second cav. I spoke too soon. There's one. Um, but that, you know, that rate of trade is something that I'll happily take. And then the main um, infantry here, I, I've got them kind of in covered positions uh, where on the off chance that the Union was to attack my main body, they'd be doing so over up. Sorry, uphill and over open terrain. Um, so the second cav finishes off those skirmishers, wheels around. It doesn't pan out, but I have like dreams of capturing those sharpshooters from the rear or the flank with the melee cav. Um, and I, spoiler alert, I, I do get over cocky with the melee cav and it costs me the unit in the course of this battle, which is... Um, I mean, hey, it's it's whatever. It's a shame, but it's also no fun if these battles are cakewalks every time. So I'm um, issuing orders, and, and basically with this first Union here, like the game wants you to just kind of march straight into those Union guns, and you, you can actually win that battle um, if you attack along a very narrow corridor. So you, you use the Napoleonic Flying Column. You punch a hole somewhere, um and uh, push into that toehold. You can win the battle that way, and it's actually, it's messy, but it's light on, lighter on casualties than maybe you'd initially think. Um, but instead of doing that, my plan here with the Confederates is an extreme uh, left hook into the Union right, which is, the, and the next time the camera zooms out, you'll see wide open. Uh, their flank is unsecured and it's wide open terrain to maneuver and uh, I like that that strategy um, doubly so because my reinforcements come in in that position and so they can sort of naturally support the existing offensive arm um, as well as compared to sort of working hard to maneuver out. Now, if I'd been smart here, I would have charged uh, that sharpshooter unit with these skirmishers um, they have line infantry melee stats, and the skirmishers, I mean, don't, right? And they've got a, a very crappy weapon when it comes to the use of melee. So uh, there there would have been a way that I think watching this in, in retrospective, I could have captured um, that sharpshooter unit and then maybe picked up a couple of those sharp rifles, which, you know, would have been a hell of a, <clears throat> a, hell of a find. Uh, but as it is, I'm actually very pleased um, with the performance of just sort of a, a mass swarm of skirmishers like this. I don't actually intend them to uh, fulfill the role they end up filling in the course of this battle. Um, but having seen it, like the strategy sort of <laughs> the strategy sort of came together on a whim, uh, and. You know, I'm actually kind of okay with it. And so, uh, w 
to sort of talk about kind of how the battle unfolds. Uh, this swarm of skirmishers ends up kind of living in the trees. Um, and I, I don't intend it to happen this way, but they bait out two or three Union brigades who are begin kind of pushing into the center for reasons I can't really honestly figure, you know, why, you know, why they would, but they do. Um, so they come up to where those houses are to the left of the existing unit of Union skirmishers. And we trade, we trade rounds, uh, basically. It's, it's kind of all that happens. Um, and uh, because there's so many small units, uh, and they're all in woods, and they're all in good cover, and you know they're all maneuverable and all that kind of stuff, every time that a Union brigade comes out, um, they get shot at from five or six different directions, and their morale just tanks. And yeah, they don't ever r really... Um, inflict super casualties like they, no one's gonna break a union or anything like that but they all of them really impress me and they all pull their weight the main line does basically what the, I expect the main line would do um, and so they're fine as far as that part's concerned uh, the, ca the, the artillery really impresses me especially of course the, the first howitzers the ones that we've been using since the beginning of the game but they're at 70 efficiency so them doing well is not terribly surprising uh, it's the other units that um, have, uh, you know, sub subpar guns and subpar efficiency. They all impress me as well, um, and I'm not perfect about using the artillery in this fight, but uh, I'm really aggressive with them, and it, it it pays dividends. So, initially, what I'm planning on doing here is just kind of deploying here, pressing fast forward, and waiting for reinforcements to come in, and I kind of decide that that's boring. And I want to do something different. <laughs> so um, I let 2nd Cavalry get into position. Into those trees there. And they rest up. Um, yeah, I, d I do press fast forward now. And there's nothing wrong with this strategy, um, but it doesn't make for good YouTube, first of all. And um, secondly, it's not fun to play. Like, you know, I mean, I'm making these videos because it's fun and I'm pref uh, I'm playing the game because it's fun. And the optimal strategy might be to wait until all 40-some thousand of my soldiers are here and just swarm down on the Confederates, or sorry, the Union. Um you know, but I have the opportunity here to dislodge Chapman and maybe even knock out that battery, the uh, Whedon, from the battle uh, before any reinforcements arrive. And that would put the Confederacy uh, in a very good position to control that central uh, flag. And this is the thought process that I have. It doesn't, you'll see how it bears out. Um, the The initial thought process is like, oh, you know, if we can dislodge the Union from the center, they're going to try and take that flag back, and then in so doing, I will have fulfilled that maxim of turning your offensive battles into uh, defensive battles. Um, so here I'm prepping the artillery, getting it into position. And uh, I'm not great about using the officers, in uh, in this fight, when these get big like this, uh, I'm not amazing about it. Um, but it's not super duper needed with the first core. First core is composed of all veterans who have seen battle multiple times. It's it's second core that needs more babysitting uh, because that's mostly new units. All right, so yeah, and, and there's me using the mouse there. My intent is to sort of get these three brigades formed into a division line. Uh, in advance, uh, and this is why I think that entrenchments are basically death traps. Um, Chapman is spread one one brigade across the entire length of that defensive position there, and it still follows this rules this game's rules about shooting, i.e., one brigade can shoot one other brigade, and there might be some desultory fire that 
um, things get caught in the process, but it's not 2,131 individual Union soldiers targeting independently. It's one brigade. So if I was to attack from the front, it could pick 10th, 1st, or I think it's 8th, I can't tell, infantry, and shoot them, and it wouldn't be able to shoot the others, 3rd, not 8th. So 10th, 1st, and 3rd are approaching from the Union far, far, far right, and all of them are going to be able to shoot at all of Chapman's brigade uh, position, not just the guys on the far on the far right of that dug-in position. If you can target any part of the brigade, you can target all of the brigade. Uh, okay, so my attack gets into position right as I start getting reinforcements. Um, and the game tells me that we have fresh units coming in from the left, and we're in the next in-game hour going to get, which I think is 20 minutes, we're going to get uh, reinforcements on our right. Also, the battle map significantly expands which isn't great because it now means I have a whole flank that didn't exist five seconds ago to defend. Um, pause, issue orders for the fresh troops. I get fancy here and I start trying to tell individual brigades to march along the road. And, it, you know, when it's a small battle, that's fine. <laughs> when, when the engagements get to a certain size, that level of finesse, um, you can you can certainly... If you're so inclined, you can apply that level of detail, you know, or you can just like, eh, we'll figure it out. Um, as the game scales, I get a lot less specific about the maneuvers of individual, but you know, like when you have eight units, you can really afford to spend the mental energy um, finally maneuvering eight of them. And when you have 60, it's a little different. It's a little different. Um, so here, here, I could eat a lot of canister from Whedon's battery, um, but I instead decided to just focus all the fire on it and take the artillery out. I don't know how many rules at this point in time I've got in terms of, you know, always have screeners and always try and take your offensive battles and turn those into defensive battles too. Um, and and defensive works are death traps, so that's three that off the top the top of my head that I can think of. I think I've talked about prioritizing targeting artillery before, but uh, I really want to just sort of re hit that point. Um, this engagement here is a lot more bloody if I'm sitting there trading canisters. So I'm excited because I'm like, oh, I'm gonna get second cab in there and try and grab Whedon, except that now there's Farnsworth coming from the south, and that means that the Union has reinforcements to their um, to their, I guess their, uh, right rear, I suppose. Um, and so that sort of stalls my advance because now I kind of have to, yeah. And then this throws me entirely for a loop. So there's Martindale's brigade coming out of nowhere, as far as I'm concerned, to attack all these skirmishers. And my initial thought is like, oh, I need to move infantry over to counter the move, you know, but do I? I mean, frankly, I've got some that I could put down there. Um, but I don't think that uh, an engagement to the front is the right move. Just, you know, trading blows with the Union across the river. That seems like a, a good recipe to lose a lot of guys. So I realize now that all of these skirmishers, Martindale's, he's not pinned. He's just wasting shots on skirmishers. Um, and so I get the idea that like maybe I can use them as the anchor uh, and then focus my efforts like I wanted to on the flanks. And I am not as aggressive here as I should be in terms of moving the infantry into what little cover position they they can get because there's not a lot of this is kind of an open field battle um, at this portion of the fight and it's as you may imagine it's bloody as a result I think poor third infantry just gets reamed um, I know someone and I think it's third I know someone gets knocked under a thousand soldiers which is a fairly rare occurrence and I'm pretty sure it's third because they just 
and just slug it out with these units. So I'm not really sure what to do with 2nd Cav at this point because there's these brigades are too large to sort of effectively engage them with melee cavalry. Um, and I should have, you know, look, watching this in, in retrospect, I absolutely should have followed the initial attack up with uh, artillery right up on its heels because this attack, this Union counteroffensive towards um, Boatswain's Woods would... Uh, be a lot bloodier for them. I don't. I, I think it still would have, you know, bloodied my nose too. But eating, eating canister fire from the 24 pounds and the 12 pound howitzers, they, their losses would get to a threshold where they wouldn't be able to continue the press. So I'm I'm falling back wherever I need to with my skirmishers. Um, I'd intended to charge one unit of artillery and realize that all of a sudden there's three, and so I'm in this very kind of like Faustian position where I'm damned if I do and I'm damned if I don't. Um, if I continue to fight the one in front, I'm gonna just absorb canister fire, um, and so my thought process is is I need to try and engage all three of the artillery units and it cost me second calf because they're just too deeply overextended at this point um but i wanted to yeah so i wanted to do is it, what i end up doing here essentially is route getty route the other one and charge the third and prevent all three from firing off um canister and then just kind of circle around and get the ones that I get or, or whatever, but I, I guess their cavalry unit got me or something, and I just, I wasn't in a position in terms of the battle to to uh, get supporting infantry over there to recapture second cab, which is a real shame, because they had some good experience, and more importantly, those Colts aren't the men aren't cheap, the officer isn't cheap, and the Colt isn't cheap. Um... And sometimes that kind of thing is going to happen. So, you know, it sucks. Um, but it's not like a <laughs> re-rack the save game or something. Okay, so the infantry is... This firefight's bloody. Uh, with 4th, 3rd, and 12th infantry going up against Bartlett. I don't... He's just... He just stands there and he takes these insane volleys and just doesn't seem to care. So Martindale's pressing, and I just keep falling back. Um, and he's, you know, overextended, completely isolated by himself. Well, he was. Um, and it's like I said before, he, the unit's being fired at from so many different directions that uh, it's not that I'm causing overwhelming casualties. Frankly, I'm not. It's, it's causing morale shock um, to the point that the units become combat and effective. So I've got those 12 pound howitzers pouring point blank range firepower into Bartlett and I'm realizing it's still not enough. And yeah, there, so there's 3rd Infantry just went under 1,000 people. Um, and so now I have to kind of baby them for the rest of the battle for like for good reasons. And it occurs to me now watching this, it's probably Farnsworth that's causing all this morale damage. So mounted infantry... So I guess you could say carbine cav. Carbine cav on horseback has this very interesting trait where you watch the 12th infantry fire. That volley takes time. It's over, you know, three, three, four seconds or something. For whatever reason, when a carbine cav unit on horseback fires, it fires all those rounds all at once. And if you can do so from the flank, um, that causes a lot of morale damage. And it can paralyze a unit basically in one volley because of that. I've seen it happen, especially when I was foolish and had my dudes in um, in defensive works. I, I've been really shocked at the effect efficacy of carbine cav 
not in causing actual casualties because they don't they, 10 20 guys whatever but it's like 10 20 guys like all at once it's 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 wild to watch that morale bar just disappear so i'm very nervous now because i've got first habits are basically exposed um and they're still reloading and, and all that kind of stuff uh i think they do get off a volley before anything serious happens and so it's sort of that one artillery unit by itself basically saves this uh central thrust um that ends up becoming the linchpin of my like i said extreme left hook and we'll watch it play out over the course of the rest of the video that left hook but yeah bartlett's very much impressing me now now warren it was Martinique or something that was that was up there before Wilkinson maybe, and now it's Warren getting shot at. So first Howitzer is just going to go ahead and take a butcher's toll. Oh, maybe not. I guess Bartlett decided to get out of there before first Howitzer could really come online, which is probably smart because they don't want to. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be there. So now I've got the problem that there is Union counter battery fire targeting first howitzer. And uh, because the rest of my reinforcements aren't here yet, more specifically the parrot guns, I don't have an effective counter. I have uh, gambled off my melee cav too early. It's my fault. And now uh, I'm taking needless casualties. Skirmishers are advancing simply to keep Griffin engaged to his front while the 10th Infantry moves into range to engage from their flank. Here comes their big push. This is a perfect, this is a perfect flying column attack. Taylor in the front. It's unfortunate for the men in Taylor's brigade. They're going to take a lot of casualties, but Chapman is well positioned to carry this offensive through except for the fact that this is stationary infantry with two brigades of artillery and support and so that canister is simply lethal and then first infantry has i think lorenzo's uh, and they're providing uh flank fire accurate uh flank fire both because the gun itself is accurate and also the units the soldiers firing it know a thing or two about pulling a trigger. So what absolutely should be, from the Union perspective, an effective uh, flying column. Um, it's it's not cheap for me to throw it back, uh, but it does get repulsed. Um, effective counterfire as well from Second Howitzer, and they did a great job too. seventh up to sort of support the flank and almost sort of like a, a V. So I'm baiting the Union towards the, the middle of a V in the center of which is basically just like death. And now we're, we're, we're slowly able to get these new reinforcements into position and they've had to walk an awful lot but but when they get into position they basically enact the the left hook portion of the battle and then from the purpose from the perspective of of the confederacy watching um the the back half of this fight it really quickly goes my way um once uh confederate troopers enter these woods and get into uh position So you notice I have the game s slowed down to, I want to say, three-quarters speed or maybe half speed at this point in time. And 
And this is something that you can do when you don't want to, you don't think that it warrants fully pausing it, especially because you want to see how some things play out. But there are enough pieces moving all at once that you would not be able to meaningfully track them if the game was tracking in real time. Um, and because at this point, functionally, as far as I'm concerned, there's two smaller battles hurt happening here. Um, I had the game slow down while I got these troops into position because I needed to focus <clears throat> uh, around like this. And things have stabilized enough that I feel ready to speed it back up. So now Warren is the one that's in the, the his turn in the barrel, I guess. And that I'm pretty sure somebody else is going to move into the trench works and then, you know, 10th infantry will just go ahead and milk some kills. Yeah. All right, so we we make things full speed. With uh, the oh man, so Bartlett uh, attempts to initiate an offensive and it just goes nowhere. Some skirmishers get routed in the woods. Um, I start pushing forward with the second course troopers. And you're looking at the bottom of the screen, the green health bar on the unit cards is a pretty good indicator of the kind of damage those units have taken and with the exception of one of the line infantry units it's about halfway full which is probably third um you know casualties on the confederate side look pretty light so far now some of the skirmishers are taking definitely their fair share of losses um oh wow yeah so the left hook's coming into position now, and it's starting to take its toll on Farnsworth's cavalry. So that's where I'm going to probably end up capturing a bunch of um, carbines. And uh, the line infantry is is removing, basically, uh, the Union artillery. It's just deleting it. Now I shift fire with 2nd Infantry from the routing artillery, which, yes, theoretically speaking, I could I could break, which would be great to shatter the unit altogether towards uh, Hayes or Keys, and it's Hayes. Um, because, again, I'm, I'm just, I don't want to take canister at this close range, first of all. Secondly, 2nd Infantry is one of my more elite units, two stars, and they have uh, Lorenzo's or Enfield's. Um, you know, and it's one of those things where I might let a, a 2,500 man Springfield unit slug it out, but I'm going to not baby them. Like, if I get to the point where I've got three star units, I might baby them. Um, but two star units, you know, just be careful. So, I realize now that 10th Infantry is overextended try and get them to fall back but they've received morale shock notice they're at 21 percent morale and so they have a but they also have a full reload bar so this is what i do i tell them they can't shoot and i force them to fall back um otherwise they would attempt to keep shooting and in so doing uh nearly guarantee either you know being routed or shocked away or whatever um so now Buchanan decides he wants to occupy the trenches so the skirmishers can have fun with them for a while. And, um, you know, looking at the mini-map, you know, the left hook is falling into place. You know, Union artillery on their far right has completely fallen and been removed, basically. They've got a severely understrength battery in the center, and then I'm pretty sure they've got one or two cannons on their far left. 
Um, but I haven't actually seen cannon fire come from that direction yet. It's a surprisingly heavy push from the Union, especially because there's no objective in this field. They, if they you know, were to capture and wipe out all of these units, like I would certainly get salty over the casualties. Um, okay, so we've moved into the third phase of the battle, and this means that I'm going to get all of my units, and um, if they have any units, they're going to get all of theirs as well. Yeah, prepare for the final assault. So theoretically speaking, if I'd listened to instructions, I would just be sitting there up until now waiting for the... Um, final reinforcements to get into position which just seems like a really boring video for you to watch and uh, a really boring battle for me to play um so let's take a look at the very south of the map here you see these sort of green bushes so there's marsh terrain and uh, and then there's this very thin line of trees at the top of a hill where those skirmishers are taking a position now um and basically my battle plan is to, the whole point of the left hook is to push the Union into that marsh, occupy this thin copse of trees, and then, I mean, that's fish in a barrel at that point. They're coming uphill over open terrain against, you know, entrenched infantry, or sorry, emplaced stationary infantry and wooded cover firing downhill. Uh second or third maxim is all, turn all your battles into defensive engagements That's exactly what I'm trying to do here um, detaching those skirmishers in this position back here where uh, 15, 14, and 13 are it I'm not expecting to be engaged in that position but I don't want to have a hole through which the union could maneuver and so they're simply there is a screen um, and to capture whatever stragglers. I'm expecting that after getting um, reamed by the main battle line, whatever is left over that tries to push through those skirmishers, the 750 of them should probably be able to throw back. Okay, our final reinforcements are coming in, and uh, the Union seems obsessed with pushing up the middle into this open field for no reason. Um, so I deviate from the continuation of my left hook, A, because it would take them too long to get into position, and B, I think I have enough forces coming from the Union's right that it's fine. Um, I detach some skirmishers there to try and capture that supply wagon because it's money, and I don't think that I'm going to have the opportunity to capture, you know, roughly a thousand guys for, um free soldiers this time so it is what it is um but you know I'm, I'm enacting the final phases of this battle plan and i'm starting to occupy this elevated ridge line of trees with units um and it it, it is kind of an ad hoc thing where I'm just sort of throwing what I've got into position as compared to um, I specifically planned 3rd Infantry to take this position I'm Just it's just whatever ends up being kind of appropriate in terms of they've got the right kind of weapon and they're the right kind of size like I'm not going to put 2500 guys you know in the back corner but 3rd Infantry who's just really had a rough go of at this battle yeah they can absolutely take that position in the rear that kind of thing so now I push the artillery right up on the ass uh, of the battle line and, and they're going to basically spend the rest of the engagement um, following uh, the infantry because I'm in the I'm in I'm in the final phases of the battle at this point so I've captured two of the three flags I'm getting my troops into position to um push the Union out of their last uh, enclave. And then, you know, uh, I'll milk the Union forces in the swamp for as many kills as I can before the battle timer runs out. So 
So that's it. What you see there is all that's left. Uh, oh, well, if there are more things left, I can't find them. And I've cast a pretty wide net at this point. So we're moving up, uh, eighth, seventh, fourth, first, and they're moving up. But um, notice that I'm moving into covered positions. I prob I probably should have been there, honestly, already. But whatever. Um, I'm trusting they're going to come to me, and they do. Um, firing from cover. The sharpshooters are going to be doing their thing. Uh, I don't expect them to reap a particularly heavy toll in terms of casualties. I'm more interested in what they can offer in terms of morale damage and uh, shock. That penalty associated with being targeted from multiple angles is significant. Oh, look. Uh, it's 9th and 11th, the paired... Uh, Grenadier Brigades from the last battle. They're going to end up uh, fulfilling a very similar role in this fight once they get into position. Okay, we're getting everything ready. I completely forgot about these four units from the second core. And you're looking at the battlefield, I <laughs> kinda don't need them, right? Like you know, it's good to have everything here, all the resources I can. But now we're starting to close the noose, so to speak. They're going to try and, I think, push out once or twice more and get thrown back. And then they just sort of seem content to hold their flag. And then, you know, I take it from them. So yeah, 9th and 11th are quite literally going to be the anvil or the hammer, I can't tell, um, upon which the Union Army is crushed, uh, and everything else will press that attack. So it just occurs to me that I've got a lot of fresh troops, so these... Units, you know, 1st, 4th, 8th Infantry. They've been fighting since the beginning of the battle. They're, you know, okay. Let's get 2nd uh, Corps in there. Let's get them a chance to bloody the units up a little bit. Uh, get some experience, try and spread out the kills. And uh, I figure while we're doing that, why don't we go ahead and run my Grenadiers into position as well um, and get the attack to happen on all sides all at once. Now this was not, the timing on this wasn't planned, it just kind of worked out pretty fortuitously. Um, but I'm pretty happy with the way that this this whole series of maneuvers kind of plays out. So they're getting hit from basically every direction. 
Uh, I'm really strongly encouraging them to go south, which admittedly uh, a, a, an experienced commander in this Union's position would know is retreating to their death um, or is surrender you know, or an ignominious retreat or something. But they would not be able to take they would not be able to take this retreat and turn it into a tactical withdrawal and then launch some kind of counterattack. Uh, in, and there's nowhere for them to go that's that's not gonna that's gonna be a place where they can launch an attack from. Oh, seventh field gun is my parrot unit, and there is a Union artillery unit. Let's go ahead and have them focus on counter battery fire, and we're going to push from the grenadiers uh, to become the base. Let's sort of close the door, so to speak. So notice the line of Confederate infantry in this thin line of trees, um, blocking the swamp to the south. There is now no way the Union could, from their current position, attack any of these flags successfully. And we're going to go ahead and fold all the skirmishers back into their parent units. Um, they've done excellently. The, the swarm of skirmishers, I had no plan to have them do anywhere near as much heavy fighting as they did. I wanted them simply to act as recon and maybe the occasional sort of distraction fire. And I was very much impressed with how they performed over the course of the battle. All right, so now what I'm doing on this little main kind of upside down C shape is I may have used 9th and 11th to push the, con the Union out, but now I'm moving rifle armed troops up. So the Grenadier type units are offensive maneuver units where I don't need to rely on them to shoot too much at far ranges because they're meant to maneuver close and they're meant to engage in melee and the Springfield 42 actually has pretty decent melee stats um, but I'm now maneuvering all of the uh, rifle armed troops into their defensive positions because at this point it is now a defensive battle um if the Union decides they want to launch a counterattack. I want to engage accurately from as far away as possible, and that's where rifle armed troops come into play. And it's also, to a degree, why I can afford for those units to be smaller, um, because in a lot of times they're used in sort of a counteroffensive, uh, sorry, a defensive manner, whereas the larger units, I think I need them to be larger so that I can absorb some losses. And the game decides, oh, we're going to end. So, um, a little under 4,000 casualties for a little under 9,000 casualties. It's not perfect. I, you know, we had a better ratio in the last battle, but um, really happy with the way the battle played out. Some promotions for some of my officers captured a whole bunch of Enfields, which is excellent. Um, and more sharps so I can stand up a third unit of um, mounted infantry probably uh, which is my intention and I don't think that I got any sharps which is a shame a couple of guys from one of the, the cabinets and a, and, a, and a new general AP Hill AP Hill is a great general um, we're going to put the points into one each of economics and medicine um I debate Army Org because I really would like to get uh, to the point where I can put six brigades in each division. Um, but I also kind of wonder how necessary it is. Plus, there's a whole new bevy of officers and a whole new thing of weapons. And, ooh, reputation. I can use two different seven-point reputation things to get about a brigade's worth of Enfields, which is great. Well, hey, so this has been the Battle of Gaines Mill. Thanks for watching. Um, we are playing 
Ultimate General Civil War on the normal Confederate Let's Play, and this is Fiasco. Um, thanks very much for sticking around, and I'll see you later.